morning here in the name of the Lord. It's hard to believe here. We're, we're halfway now here into the season of Lent, the third Sunday in Lent. We continue to begin to unpack who Jesus is and just exactly what he's come to do. And that's going to be very evident for us today as we're going to deal with this very interesting episode of Jesus now cleaning out the temple. What on earth is he doing in there? And why is he doing it? And that's, that's going to be the focus here of our sermon then this day. As we begin our worship then as we sing our opening hymn, 645, Built on the Rock.
service one found on page 151. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins unto God, our Father, and invite the congregation in to please you. Most merciful God, we, we confess, confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your presence and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like the congregation then to please stand as you listen to the intro. The psalmist writes, Deliver me from sinking in the mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Let not the flood sweep over me or the deep swallow me up, or the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, Turn to me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. God, whose glory it is always to have mercy. Be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways, and bring them again with repentant hearts and a steadfast faith, to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now <coughs> and forever. Testament reading for this third Sunday in Lent, it's taken from the book of Exodus, the 20th chapter. Here we get the recording here of the Lord giving to his son Israel the Ten Commandments. You have to remember, as we talked about in our Sunday morning Bible studies, we just finished up the Ten Commandments today here, as we're walking through Luther's Catechism. That when you know, we often hear, uh, especially if you watch the old movie, the, the Ten Commandments in Charlton Heston. Moses keeps going to Pharaoh, let my people go, that actually there in the Hebrew it's let my son go. Because Israel is now 
God's son again. Adam, first son, first man failed. So now God is going to now recreate another son. And there where Adam broke the image of God, this is what it's now going to look like to have that image beginning to be restored. Once again, it will be finally restored at the resurrection. But this is what it looks like now to be that image bearer. Actually, the Ten Commandments are not a bunch of do's and don'ts on a paper. This is, this is what it is. This is what it looks like now to be a human being that was created in the image and likeness of God. Because when Christ comes, he's coming to fulfill all these, as we've been reading, because he now is, as Paul says in Colossians, the image of God. He's the last son, the last Adam, who's come now to undo what the first Adam did with his rebellion. So now we hear then these words as God gives the Ten Commandments. And again, you have to remember, it's not God gives the commandments and says, if you keep them, you become my son. No, if I rescued my son, brought him out of Egypt, now go and live as my son. You, you are my son. This is what it means now to live as my son, or my child now, in God. Hear then what the Lord says. And God spoke all these things, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Therefore, since he's the one who did it, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me. And keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. I'm going to hit the pause button here for a moment. Because we're getting ready to start here in the next couple of weeks. First article of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And so often, ah, uh, you don't have to believe that God created the world in six days. Six 24-hour days. But the interesting thing is, that doctrine is not only there in Genesis 1 and 2, but it's wired into the Ten Commandments. For in six 24-hour days, I made everything. And who wrote this? Jesus. He thinks the world was created in six 24-hour days. It always goes back to Luther's great point. Be very careful who you choose to read the Bible. I always read the Bible with Jesus. And he'll explain to me what it all means. And this is one of the ways that as we start that study here in the next couple of weeks, as we look at, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, the six days of creation are actually wired into the third commandment. Because again, go back here, it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For here it is. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle then is from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, the first chapter. St. Paul writes, The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, 
It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to the Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards, and not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Thanks be to God. We'd like the congregation then to stand as we sing the Lenten response in honor to the Holy God.
mercy and peace be to all of you from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's just continue here this morning where we left off last week with Jesus' question to his disciples, who do people say that I am? You know what, for the modern person, I don't think they really give a rip about who Jesus really is. They, they don't care. If you ask them that question, I don't think they'd really give an answer that, that talks about who Jesus is. They would tell you more of what they think he's like. They would say he's, he's loving, he's kind, he's patient, he's tolerant, he's meek, he's mild, he's always inviting, always affirming, always happy. So if you take those answers and use it to answer the question that Jesus asked, who do people say that I am? The people today in our modern world would say Jesus is a life coach, a therapist. But how foreign is that to the real historical Jesus? The Jesus that is found in the pages of the four Gospels. A Jesus who actually comes in storms in and out of people's lives. Making implicit and explicit demands. Making most people sometimes feel not very loved, but mighty uncomfortable. Why do you think we put him on a cross? You don't put a do-gooder Boy Scout on a cross. You put somebody who's a troublemaker, uh, a nuisance. You put a pest on the cross. And, and here's just a few examples here this morning of how Jesus was a troublemaker. He looks upon the religious bigwigs of his day with anger, the Gospels say, and calls them a brood of vipers, white sepulchers, whitewashed tombs. He speaks openly about a final judgment and how many people are going to burn in a fiery lake of sulfur. He talks about a sin that God will never forgive. He destroys a whole herd of pigs, gets the pork producers of Palestine, all mad at him, and he does it without any regret or compensation to the owner. As we saw last week, he calls Peter his best friend, Satan. He says the Sadducees are spiritually stupid. He says the people who aren't ready for judgment day are morons. And then he describes his entire generation as being faithless. He says, how long am I going to have to put up with you all? Now, that being said, I don't think Jesus would have ever been Time Magazine's Rabbi of the Year. And as we heard here in our Gospel reading, and saw in our Gospel reading here today, he probably should have been arrested for assault and battery. Yes, Jesus is a meek and mild Jesus. But sometimes he can also be kind of a mean and a wild Jesus. The God that we thought was under lock and key and confined to the pages of the Old Testament, we find here today in our Gospel reading, roaming through the pages of the New Testament, the so-called Testament of peace and love and joy. He swirls. It touches down like a tornado. It's exactly what he does in our gospel reading here today. Let me, let me read a portion to you again. In the temple, John says, Jesus found those who were selling oxen, sheep, and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there, and making a whip, of course. That's quite an image. Jesus sitting there, tying it, twisting it all together. He makes a whip, of course, and drives them, John says, all out of the temple, with the sheep and the ox, cleans out the whole place. Nobody left. And then he pours out the money changers, coins, and turns over their tables. Now, I don't know about you here this morning, but this episode kind of makes me mighty uncomfortable. For this incident in the temple makes Jesus out to be kind of a one-man special ops unit. He's kind of a first century Rambo. Especially when you think about the fact that there was a very heavy temple guard there. A military presence. And Jesus, an unarmed man, except for the whip, runs around cleaning the whole place out and you mean to tell me the military that was in the temple couldn't do anything to stop him? This kind of seems like a guy that you don't want to mess with. This, this Jesus here this morning, I have to admit, kind of scares me. 
And he scares me because I'm left standing up here this morning asking the question, why? Why does Jesus do this? Why is his face red? Why are the veins popping out on his neck? Why is his voice raging? Why do we hear the crack of the whip that he made over and over and over again? Why are the sheep scattering in all directions? Why are the cattle bolting and running over people? Why are the people running this way and that way in the temple, yelling out, run, get out of here, because there's a lunatic on the loose in the temple? Why? What's going on? What, what has happened to Jesus here this morning? Did he have a bad hair day? Wake up on the wrong side of the bed? Does Jesus have some anger management issues? What happened to Jesus? What's the purpose of all this here this morning? Well, often we kind of hear this is about Jesus, you know, cleansing the temple. He's driving out those who are misusing it and restoring it to the house of prayer that it should have been. And that's a part of it. But in the context of the other three Gospels, especially in context of Mark's Gospel that we studied in our Sunday morning Bible studies here last year. And when we looked at Mark's account of this, it's sandwiched. The cleansing of the temple is actually sandwiched right between Jesus cursing the fig tree as they're going, and then the fig tree, when they come back, is dead. You begin to kind of understand then, with that context, what Mark is trying to get across to us as of what really happened here in the temple and why. It's not that Jesus is reforming the temple. In the context of the cursing of the fig tree, he's cursing it and he's replacing it. He's bringing it to an end. If all Jesus was worried about is dealing with unjust business practices, then just go over, take care of the money changers, kick them out, and end it and be done with it. Just deal with the guilty ones, and that's it. But notice John is getting across here today that everything and everyone, including all the animals, everybody goes. Everybody that. As one scholar put it, if money now cannot be exchanged into the holy currency, then the monetary support for the temple sacrifices and priesthood must end. If the sacrificial animals are no longer there, plus they cannot be purchased, then the sacrifices must come to an end. Basically, all temple activity must come to an end. And he's right. That's the point of all this. Jesus didn't come to restore the temple. He came to end it, to replace it. Which is exactly why the people ask him, Hey, by what sign, by what authority do you do this? Notice Jesus' answer, because here he's giving us the explanation. Destroy this temple, because the earthly physical temple is pointing to the temple of his body. He says, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. That's the key here that unlocks this whole thing. For John says he was speaking about the temple of his own body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This event today is not a reform of the temple. It's a rejection of it. We don't need it anymore. It's time, it's purpose, to come to an end. We don't need lambs anymore. We don't need any sacrifices anymore. Why? Because let's go back to the question of last week that we started with here this morning. Who is this Jesus? We got the answer Wednesday night in the gospel reading here in our Wednesday night Lenten service where John the Baptist says, Who is Jesus? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The once for all forever sacrifice that all the other temple sacrifices pointed to is now on the scene. He's arrived. So the temple is no longer needed. 
But you might be sitting there this morning kind of saying, okay, Pastor, I'm kind of tracking with you, especially when I go back to last year and kind of remember the Bible study there in the Gospel of Mark, but I don't know here, why, why does Jesus still have to get all berserk here this morning? In the, in, in the gospel reading. I mean, I, I thought Jesus was all about peace and love and joy. And, and okay, we heard Wednesday night, Jesus is the Lamb of God, and I thought lambs were kind of meek and mild prayers. So, you know, could, couldn't he have done this in kind of a nicer way? Well, my friends, if we, if we go back here again to that Bible study on Sunday morning, the Gospel of Mark, we see what this is all pointing to, what the context is. It's an act of judgment that's pointing to what? Judgment day. To the final judgment. Where sin's going to be punished. And all it takes is one little slip up. And God is going to literally give you a whipping. Yes, Jesus is, is, is meek and mild. But we can't forget what we read in our Old Testament reading here today in the commandments where this Jesus says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Yes, he's showing steadfast love to thousands of them who love me and keep my commandments. But to those who hate me, he's visiting the iniquity into a third and fourth generation. See, my friends, I... I hate to say it, but, but life isn't about doing your best and trying hard. This isn't a kindergarten basketball game. God is in the business of keeping score. And the problem is, is we can't score. We can't put any positive numbers on the board. And yet, and yet judgment day is coming. The day of reckoning is drawing near. We confess it in the creed. He's coming in glory to judge the living and the dead. So as we wrap it up here today, here's, here's the big take-home point that kind of ties the whole thing together. <clears throat> if you never encounter this Jesus here this morning, the Jesus who is the judge, you'll never be able to encounter Jesus the Savior, the one who shows his steadfast love to thousands. Because if you have to ask the question, what's he saving you from? From what? Some imaginary judgment? An imaginary hell? What's he saving you from? And that's, that's the problem with the U.S. Jesus. The one that we've kind of created here in our country. You never have to be a sinner in the hands of an angry God. Which is what we see today. You don't have to face the music. You don't have to stand naked in a shame in front of a holy God. You need to just run around and never have to face reality. You need to run around a total pretend universe, this is what we do today, playing silly games, singing silly songs, maybe even in church on a Sunday morning, and pretend that your happiness, rather than God's holiness, is the matter, is the, is the main issue. And that's exactly why the love of Jesus is not some sappy, ooey-gooey, pat-on-the-back emotional love. It's a bold, sacrificial, totally committed, full of action love. It's really on display here today in the temple. A love that's going to do anything to save you. A love that's going to go the distance and lay it all on the line, even his own life. Because as we've seen here over the last couple of Wednesday nights, that's what Jesus has come to do. What's he come to save us from? We heard it Wednesday in our epistle. To save us from his own wrath. It's the old switcheroo that we've been talking about. He's come to take your place and to face the music for you. The judge has announced the verdict. Guilty. The sentence, death. The judge actually gets out from behind the bench and comes out to where you're seated, pushes you aside and says, I'll take your place. That's what it means to be the Lamb of God. And then he lugs his own torture rack across up the hill to Calvary. <clears throat> Jesus becomes the sinner in the hands of an angry God. He takes the whipping for you. What does he do? He stands there totally naked and ashamed in front of a holy God. He becomes 
all that you are, as we talked about Wednesday night, unholy, as he becomes sin for us, so that you can now become all that he is, which is holy. In the one person of Christ, the justice and the mercy and the love of God all meet and are satisfied. And my dear friends, that is the type of God that you need. You don't need a talk show host as your God. You don't need a massage therapist, a manicurist, or a financial guru as your God. You need this Jesus in the temple here this morning who will go to radical and extreme lengths to save you. A God who is potent, powerful, and almighty because he's doing battle with something that you can't deal with. We sang that as we started the season of Lent with his temptation in the wilderness as we sang a mighty fortress as our God. Where Luther writes, on earth is not his equal. Who's that? Satan. None of us can go up against Satan and do battle. We need a God who can actually do that. A God who means business. We'll see that on Good Friday as our text at the Tenebrae service. Will be that Jesus, John tells us, came to destroy the works of the devil. He's come to destroy sin, death, and the devil before it destroys you. So who is this Jesus? Well, we don't need some mamby-pamby Jesus who will run around, you know, running a spa and give you a stress-relieving facial. We need a Jesus who's going to get down and dirty, a Jesus who's going to get bloody, a Jesus who can actually go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, as we saw on the first Sunday of Lent out there in the wilderness, toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil, the old evil foe, and as you see in the book of Revelation, plunge a dagger in the heart of the dragon. And when Holy Week rolls around, that's exactly what you're going to get. A Savior who is awesome, fierce, tenacious. One that is the choir will sing. They'll make you cause to, to pause and, and, and whisper and stare. And even sometimes it causes me to tremble. A loving and victorious Savior who will make you gasp and stare. A Savior, you have to remember, is not only just a lamb, but is also a lion. Kind of the lion that I always like to see is like the lion in C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. He's a lion that C.S. Lewis writes, is yes, meek and mild and humble and wonderful and loving, but he's also dangerous. All at the same time. And that's, that's evident here this morning. Because that's the real Jesus. Yes, one who is meek and mild. Who will humble himself and become obedient to death, even death on the cross. But also one who has what it takes. To do what needs to be done and can be mean and wild. A God who's pulsing with unnerving but yet irresistible love. For the real Jesus came to seek and to save sinners. Amen. And now may the peace of God pass us all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds and faith in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. Amen. Look by the congregation and to please stand we confess the Christian faith with the words of the Nicene. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things that soul and in this soul, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again in the glory to judge both the living and the dead, 
whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. I'd like the congregation then to please kneel for the prayer of the church. O oh Lord, you tell us today that you are a jealous God. So save the third and fourth generations that will come after us from your eternal wrath and punishment. Fill us with your son's zeal for your house, that we may cast away every idol from our hearts and be devoted to you and your commandments. Lord, in your mercy. Lord. Hear our prayer. O oh Lord of perfect love, you have called us to honor our parents and all those who are in authorities that it may go well with us in our land. Bless our president, our governor, and all who govern us. Make them wise in their ways, that your justice may be upheld among us. Help us to serve and obey in accord with your good and gracious will. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. O Lord, our God, your steadfast love in Christ is good. Turn your abundant mercy toward all who suffer in our midst. Especially in this day, we remember Doris, Bev, Jesus, Diane, Mel, Kelsey, Bev, Ken, Carola, Lucy, Donnie, Stephanie, Jim, Don, Kelly, Jerry, Loretta, Shirley, Gisla, Rhonda, Diane, Harold, Torin, Tim, and Catherine. Do not let the flood sweep over them, nor the pit close its mouth on them. Grant them healing, comfort, and peace. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, our rock and redeemer, three days after the temple of your son's body was destroyed by wicked men, you raised it up again. Grant that on the last day we and all saints who now rest in your presence may share in the glory of his resurrection. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Into your hands, then, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Congregation may be seated as we gather our offering. At the end, we'll stand and sing the offertory, hymn 955, let the vineyards be grateful. <coughs>
continue then with the service of the sacrament, beginning there with the preface on page 160. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We give them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to be at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who accomplished the salvation of mankind by the tree of the cross, that where death arose, their life might also rise again, and that the serpent who overcame by the tree of the garden might likewise be overcome by the tree of the cross. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the
Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you, and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lord bless you and keep you, Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our announcements. Welcome everyone this morning here once again in the name of the Lord as we begin to unpack who Jesus is, what he's come to do. He's coming to what face God's judgment for us. And I think that's something we kind of fail to remember sometimes. And it's going to take somebody that's mighty powerful to do that. Because if you think about it, for those who don't end up in heaven, they're going to spend eternity facing what Jesus faced on the cross. For one person, it will take eternity to pay for their own personal sins. What Jesus is facing on the cross is God's punishment for the sins of all mankind, past, present, and future, until the Lord comes again. And as we've learned on Wednesday night, he's not only carrying our sin, but he's carrying our sorrows, our depression, our sadness, our diseases, all of that, so that he can end it once for all, forever, and it truly happened at the cross, and it is finished. He went toe-to-toe -to -toe with sin, death, and the power of the devil, and defeated them once for all. We're not waiting to the end to see, oh, how's this going to turn out? No, that's the good news. It's over. Sin, death, and the devil have been judged. They're finished. They're done forever. And what a, what a great gift that is. But something I think we have to remember is we see kind of the world unraveling around us. We're not waiting to see how it's going to turn out. The Lord is reigning on the throne right now. Read the book of Revelation. And, and as Paul says, he's just, God is waiting until Jesus now puts everything under his feet. So we talked about when we looked at the book of Revelation. Until he brings all the kingdoms of this earth to an end. And everything is put under, subjected under him and his feet. Then the world will come to an end. The uh, war is over. We're just in the mop-up now. And we're bringing more people into the kingdom of God. And that's what it's all about. And that's some comfort that we all need in the midst of all this. And that's what we're celebrating during the Lenten season. And we'll celebrate here during Holy Week and Easter. A couple quick announcements here. Uh, in a moment here, after the 1045 service, uh, our senior group, the seasoned saints, will have their lunch and Super Bowl game day. Uh, Pastor Rody's getting that all ready. There'll be some pizza and then the, the games and festivities here today. Then Wednesday night, we continue our midweek Lenten series, God Be Gracious to Me. We're looking at Psalm 41. We'll eat at 6. There's some sign-up sheets out there. So you want to help out with the meal. And then 7 o'clock, we'll have worship. Thursday night, book study continues at 7 o'clock. And then just a reminder, kind of will feel like spring and summer here today, but daylight saving time. Coming here at the end of the week, so you got the old-fashioned clock that you need to actually set ahead and do so on Saturday night here before you uh, go to bed so that you can put those clocks ahead one hour here and be uh, on time here for church next Sunday. And then the health ministry uh, will meet here at the end of Bible study in Sunday school next Sunday at 1030. So have a good week here in the name of the Lord. We look forward to seeing you here Wednesday night and then also next Sunday. And we'll conclude our worship then here today with our closing hymn. 644, the church's one foundation.
way.